You have to touch the music, not only to hear it. Because touching it, we, um, we feel the vibration of the music. It's a very important thing when you think about uh, the Beethoven's case. You remember when Beethoven uh, was absolutely deaf? He took a stick in his mouth, like this pencil, and he played the music, touching the stand. to have the vibrations, because he needed the, in, the, to enjoy the, vibra the uh, vibrations. Otherwise, the music was an abstract matter for him. And this is what he didn't want. And we have not to despise the will. The will is a very important thing. I also think about Beethoven, uh, what he did by will. That's also uh, you know, an element of creation. Many years ago, I was in a car accident that almost killed me. In the empty hospital cafeteria, I found a piano. I was in a wheelchair, so I rolled to the piano and the first thing I played was Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Was there a reason that by instinct I played something by Beethoven? There are many great classical composers, but the composer that has become a symbol for classical music more than anyone is probably Ludwig van Beethoven. And while his music is more complex than most of us can grasp, it also speaks to us in a basic human way. This film is not biographical, but a film that tries to answer this question. Why is it that no matter your background, no matter where you come from, no matter how much you know about classical music, Beethoven's music can and will speak to you? When Ludwig van Beethoven was born, in 1770, a new philosophical movement had started in both Europe and America. It turned away from centuries of traditions and it would change the world. When the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who died the year before Beethoven was born, wrote, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. His words created the idea of a government by the people for the people. Your own will, your own desires, should shape your life, and that would unleash your potential. Beethoven lived during these turbulent times, which included both the French and the American Revolution, and he was smitten by the new ideas. But instead of writing books or essays, he wrote music. Music that gives me, you, and everybody else strength energy, willpower, or whatever you would like to call it. It gives not only entertainment, but putting it in a mildly dramatic way, it gives our souls a direction.
This is the house in Heiligenstadt, in the outskirts of Vienna, where Beethoven stayed for six months in 1802. He lived on the upper floor of a bakery, and the street, which is now beautifully stone-paved, was then a dirt road, with almost no other buildings around it. In this pastoral and serene setting, the plan was that Beethoven would rest his ears and reverse the declining state of his hearing. At first, Beethoven seemed to relish the stay. He composed with an unrelenting productivity, and his letters reveal a man of good spirits. But eventually, the world came crashing down. As his hearing did not get better, and the isolation made his mental state vulnerable, he realized his days as a performing pianist were over, and with that, at least half of his income. He had this terrible crash, and you know, well, that's what happens when you have a disability. You deny, and then you go into despair, and you crash, and you either pull yourself up or you don't. During Beethoven's life, he would try many inventions to make up for his eventual deafness. One was to have his head inside a metal box attached to the piano, which would amplify the sound. In October, his state of mind reached a low that made him suicidal. In a letter to his brothers, never sent, but kept close to him for the rest of his life, he writes about his misery and asks not to be judged too harshly. The letter turns into a testament, as if what happens next would terminate his life. He wrote in that letter basically saying, I, I, I've thought, of course I thought about killing myself, who wouldn't? If you're a musician and a composer and you're going deaf, who wouldn't think about killing yourself? Plus the fact that he, had, he was in physical sheer pain a lot. And that was in addition to the deafness. Finally, he says in the letter, I can't imagine ending this life until I've done what I know I'm capable of. And he knew he was just getting to the point where he was writing what he had always envisioned but hadn't figured out how to do yet. The so-called Heiligenstadt Testament was a turning point in Beethoven's life. Instead of giving up, Beethoven answered his destiny by defying it. He does not say, I must do what God put me here to do. He doesn't say that because he didn't believe it. He believed in God, but he didn't believe in miracles. He believed that God created his talent in a sense because his talent came from nature and nature was God, was the real scripture as far as he was concerned. But as far as being a, a, an important composer, a great composer, he would have said, I do that myself. In 1770, the city of Bonn was the town where the Elector of Cologne had his residence. The Elector was called so because he was one of the local rulers in the Holy Roman Empire that had the power of electing the Emperor in Vienna. The Elector's name was Maximilian Friedrich and he was Beethoven's first employer. The Beethoven family was a family of musicians. Ludwig's grandfather had been the director of the court orchestra, and his father, Johann, was a court singer. Bonn was considered a beautiful town, quite small, with less than 10,000 inhabitants. It was in this town that Beethoven grew up, often abused by his father to become a second Mozart. Ludwig was often beaten and forced to practice the piano all day. And when Johann came home drunk in the middle of the night, he forced his son out of bed and made him play the piano for him and his drunken friends. Tragically falling under the spell of alcoholism and failing in his responsibilities towards his family, Johann would never be mentioned respectfully by Beethoven later in life. It was his mother, Maria, 
that was Beethoven's moral tutor and the tender voice of the family. This is the house in Bonn where Ludwig van Beethoven was born in 1770. Here, Beethoven lived during his first four years of his life. In 1784, when Beethoven was 14 years old, the philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote an essay called Answering the Question, What is Enlightenment? In it, Kant makes the case that if you let others dictate what you think and what you say, you are a victim of comfort and cowardice. The establishment of old, with rulers seen as given their powers by God, was taken over by thoughts of freedom of the individual. This is a film about events that signifies and explains the power of Beethoven's music. Beethoven wrote for humanity. Mozart wrote for people. Mm -hmm. And it's a different mindset. I'm not saying one is better than the other, it's just different. But Beethoven was devoted to, to he believed that his talent was owed to humanity. Even though he didn't like people very much, he did believe that and he worked, he, he worked himself to death to, to create something lasting and great for humanity. It was during long walks, most often in nature, that Beethoven got most of his ideas for new compositions. During one of the walks in Heiligenstadt in 1802, the idea for a new symphony started to shape in Beethoven's mind. This symphony would be a tribute to one of his heroes, Napoleon Bonaparte. For Beethoven, Napoleon was a symbol of freedom, an illusion that was shattered when Napoleon proclaimed himself emperor. The symphony was first dedicated to Napoleon, but taking the dedication away, the composer erased Napoleon's name from the score in a seemingly violent way. But even though Napoleon allowed himself to be corrupted by his own power, the power of the symphony, named the Eroica, remained. This music reflected the energy set in motion during the French Revolution. Several years later, in 1809, Beethoven wrote a piece, Egmont, that was partly a protest against Napoleon and his endless wars to conquer Europe. Egmont is the story of a count who stood up to a tyrant and was therefore sentenced to death. Almost 150 years later, the opening music to this work, the so-called Egmont Overture, found a place in the heart of a nation, and once again, Beethoven's music became a symbol of the struggle for freedom. After the Second World War, Hungary was under the sphere of the Soviet Union, who gradually made it a one-party dictatorship. The country suffered years of terror under the regime of Matyas Rakosi, who described himself as Stalin's best pupil. Rakosi was the leader of the party. He was a very cruel man. He knew about seven languages, so he was not a fool. 
During the Rakoshi years, it is estimated that at least 2,000 Hungarians were executed, 100,000 put in prison, and 44,000 were sent to labor camps, where many died due to horrible conditions. The secret police was known for arresting anyone using torture to get fake confessions. My father was fighting for the workers, and then he was arrested and, and almost killed. They uh, throw from the window a state secretary from the fourth floor. He died. And my father was all, already there in the room. They forced him to write down that uh, the state uh, secretary was uh, committed suicide. And, and uh, he didn't want to write uh, as a witness. And they, and they, they told that then you, you, you withdraw you also. And they started to go to the window. And finally he, he, he signed because uh, everybody has a feeling that <laughs> it is... Wants to live. It, yes. So it was a terrible regime. In 1953, Joseph Stalin dies. And the next Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev starts a de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union, which carries over to Hungary. The changes for the Hungarian people, however, are not enough. A large segment of the population was extremely unhappy with communism. Number one. Number two, Stalin dies. The, 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 the utmost and total terror is diluted. There was a movement, there was an unhappiness with the Stalinist years, with Rakoshi and all the killing and torturing and all that. So things begin to move. On the 22nd of October in 1956, students at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics held a meeting where something extraordinary happened. The two university students rose to the, to the uh, mic and began to speak. And all party representatives left because they could not deal with the emerging anarchy. <laughs> the meeting began to collect the demands of the students, uh, the first of which was Soviet troops should leave Hungary. I also wanted to go to, on that demonstration, but I, I was late by 10 minutes, and that saved my life. People, they made friendship with tankers, with the Russian tankers. They, they also, the driver of the tanker, were a young boy, and, and they promised that they don't kill each other. From the top of the agriculture ministry, they started to shoot. I was late and I went to the Alkotmány street and one young girl pulled me in, in the house. He told that don't go there, they are shooting people. Young, young people died. We went uh, with my colleagues to see, and it was terrible, you know, to see a, a shoe, in a, a leg in the shoe, and, and where is the body? Uh, and, <laughs> so it was terrible to see, and, uh, and I decided at that time that I will join independence. <laughs> Then the labor workers, they went to a military barracks, give us guns. And the soldiers said, please, most incredible thing. So suddenly 
people showed up with guns at the radio station building. We were lying in the morning, daytime, at night. We were lying at every wavelength. And this will now come to a stop. You will hear from us what is the truth. So suddenly the free Kossuth radio begins to broadcast. And we did not want to broadcast any stuff that was prepared before the revolution. We had the news, we had some interviews, and then we had to put some music. They were searching and not far from the broadcasting unit, there was all kinds of stuff and they realized that there was music there and they just pulled out one. And the recording and, and the playing units were right next to the broadcasting uh, unit. So they put on the thing and this happened to be the Egmont Overture of Beethoven. This overture, as a musician, you may know much better than me, that it had very important sensations and messages which were in sync with what the revolution brought out from people. Solemnity, sadness, sorrow, deep, uh, you know, falling into deep thoughts, contemplation. There were also some signs of hope in that music. And, and so because of this, people who had no notion about classical music began to really like it. So much so that people who had radios, they would put it out in the in the, in, the, in the open window and turn it out uh, the, for a blasting maximum uh, sound. And so on the streets, you could hear it. It was quite incredible. went to the Stalin statue and they pulled down the old man. The uh, boots remained, the two boots remained and the body came down. And people went there and uh, tried to get a little piece for, for taking home. grannar som inte hade någon radio så att <laughs> vi trängdes ju ett, du kan föreställa dig ett stort bord en liten radio med, eh, med sånt kastande ljud och, och, och så eh, typ eh, dussintals unga och gamla som eh, knäar runt bordet och eh, lyssnar på det så det det blev ju till någon slags eh, nationalsång istället för att man, man, eh, man sjöng ju nationalsången men eh, eh, det, det kunde man alltså inte sjunga stup i kvart. Så det, det kom ju istället eh, eh, Beethovens eh, Egmont. Det är 
Köszönöm a Magyar Népköztársaság miniszter tanácsának elnöke. Ma hajnalban a szovjet csapatok támadást indítottak fővárosunk ellen. They came in night. Twelve o'clock uh, with a jeep. They took me to near to the cemetery. There is a big uh, prison. Face to the wall and hands up, and I, I, as I saw in the films that it, it is the end, they will shoot me from, from backside. It was a long corridor there, there where they put me, and uh, I, I started to cry, I tell you frankly. I, I thought that I was 19 years old, that I was not even in love with anybody, and, and they will kill me so young. <laughs> And then one man asked me that why you are crying. I told that uh, they will kill me here in on the corridor, and he told me that you are a fool. He showed me a place that this is the place where they hang the people. Idén a kan tänka dig stormakt som sovjet och så är ett litet folk som reser sig. Ja, en viss stolthet och, och, och ja, samtidigt sorg för att ja, det är ju inte nog med att människor dog i det här upproret som kvävdes utan ett par hundratusen människor flydde ur landet. How naive I was that I had to be reminded that I didn't at once think that I should be moving and quickly. One in our group He had contacts, so he got a truck and a small car. Taking us out, we had papers in Russian and Hungarian that we were recovering uh, large milk cans.
I like, uh, uh, of course, uh, Egmont Overture and uh, the son sonats. Uh, I played uh, later when I went to another company. Uh, I had uh, colleagues and one uh, was uh, very good in violin. And we played the uh, violin uh, um, sonat concerto uh, spring, spring, Please spring, so. and uh, the other was uh, spring and Kreutzer, no, Kreutzer, no, 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 not Egmont, Egmont, Egmont is also no Kreutzer sonata, no Kreutzer, Kreutzer, yeah, we we call it Kreutzer, sorry, yes, Kreutzer, yeah, we played Kreutzer, yes. It was a warm spring day in Vienna at the end of May. The year was 1803 and at 8 o'clock in the morning a special event was about to take place at the Emperor's beautiful Augarten Palace. In the Augarten Hall two famous musicians were giving a morning concert. Ludwig van Beethoven at the piano and the violinist George Bridgetower who had impressed Beethoven so mightily with his playing that Beethoven had composed a new sonata for violin and piano dedicated to Bridge Tower. George Bridge Tower was born in Poland on the 11th of October 1778. He was the son of a black father, possibly from Barbados, but who also named himself an African king and a white mother from Swabia, then Poland. He grew up as a child prodigy on the violin, and he gave concerts in both France and England already at age 11. In 1781, the Prince of Wales, which would mean the future King George IV, took an interest in the talented young man and oversaw his education. Bridge Tower went on to give concerts mostly in England, but also in the rest of Europe. In 1802, he came to Vienna where he met and played with Beethoven, who got so excited about his playing that he wrote a sonata for him, a dedication he would eventually take away after an argument about a woman. The sonata would eventually go down in history as the Kreutzer Sonata. As so often with Beethoven, he scrambled to finish the composition in time. Bridge Tower had to play the second movement from Beethoven's handwritten score, peeking over his shoulder. Nevertheless, what the audience heard this morning was a sonata for piano and violin that did not resemble anything they heard before with this ensemble. It was a sonata where the violin would be a rebellion, a dominating voice in music that sometimes could feel like a war of wills. Before the Kreutzer Sonata, a sonata for violin and piano was actually more of a piano sonata with violin accompaniment. It was mostly the pianist who had the difficult things, and that had many reasons. One of them was that for Beethoven, for example, he did not necessarily write the violin part for a professional musician. It might have been for a count, for example, and they were supposed to play together. And then Beethoven had a much more difficult part since he was, after all, the much more accomplished instrumentalist. And also he wanted to show off. The Kreutzer changed all this. In this sonata, the violin refuses to be anything but equal to the much larger instrument, the piano. And a good example of this is the very beginning of the sonata. The introduction is first played solo by the violin and then by itself on the piano. Now, if you give me a person who never touched a piano, I can probably teach that person in about five minutes how to play the first two chords on the piano. It won't sound brilliant, but they can probably do it. The first two chords on the violin you can practice the violin for five years and you will probably not be able 
to play those first two chords. The violin has to work so much harder to do the things that are much easier to do on the piano. And that is one of the things which gives the violin part so much power.
Beethoven once wrote, what is difficult is also beautiful. For him, composing was often a long and arduous path, where he rewrote, added, removed and changed the score until he finally found the music that we listen to today. And there is something beautiful in mastering difficulties, just as it is beautiful to watch a skilled violinist master the notes of the Kreutzer Sonata. At some point in life, we have all been the violin in the Kreutzer Sonata, where we face what we think are insurmountable tasks. But just as Beethoven had to face the reality of his deafness, so does the violin stand up to the gigantic piano, of course, with the help of a fantastic violinist.
He was the son of a violent and neglectful father. He also grew up with a mother who gave him love and affection. He quit school when he was 11, and throughout his life he was unable to make basic mathematical calculations. He suffered and endured pain in a life full of bad health, and his hearing was taken away from him. A tragedy for a composer. He showed contempt for many a kind, the ignorant, the immoral, but not least, people who abuse their power. He would call rich people inwardly poor and had no problem putting his own life's work ahead of an emperor's. His mother told her children that without a struggle, there is no victory. And although that might sound like a cliché to some, nobody can deny that life was a struggle for Beethoven. His weapon in that struggle was his music. And thanks to him, this music is there for all of us. To entertain us, to touch us, to comfort us, and to strengthen us when we face the inevitable challenges of life. It is full of humanity and it asks us to be the best we can be. Den ger ändå hopp när uh, den vemodiga känslan tar över och sen kommer hoppet i alla fall. Den lyser igenom och, och, och kommer tillbaka igen. Edmund Orger. This is today for me, until today, a living element of 1956. For my life work, uh, at that time I was 70 years old, 
and uh, it was in, held in New York. 